Your heart races, a sense of terror chills you to the core. Your chest hurts and you're having trouble breathing. It can only mean one thing, you're having a panic attack. If this is you, then we at The Chrissy B Show are here to help as today we turn our attention to anxiety and panic attacks. We'll hear from our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang, who'll be helping us understand what happens to us when we suffer from anxiety, as well as giving us some tips on how to deal with a panic attack. I'll then be chatting to Jasmine Weston, who'll be telling me how she manages her anxiety and panic attacks, which she has suffered with since she was 14. Nutritionist Elise Suter will be giving me some top tips for those struggling with anxiety and panic attacks, as well as answering your nutrition questions and giving us a delicious recipe for a mango and avocado green smoothie. We hear from Mark Abrahams of Recycle Your Cycle, a charity that worked with prison students to refurbish old bicycles, who are a good cause of the week. And then at the end of the show, I'll be telling you two things you can do to reduce stress and stop anxiety. According to Anxiety UK, more than 1 in 10 people are likely to have a disabling anxiety disorder at some stage in their life. According to the NHS, currently 40% of disability worldwide is due to depression and anxiety. At least 1 in 10 people experience occasional panic attacks, which are usually triggered by a stressful event. But what is the difference between panic and anxiety? Well, Anxiety UK say panic is a sudden intense response to normal thoughts or sensations, often accompanied with a feeling of impending doom and physical symptoms such as increased heart rate, palpitations, pins and needles. Anxiety is more of a psychological condition prolonged by thought processes and rituals which cause the person affected to avoid certain situations which they believe will exacerbate their anxiety. Well, we wanted to hear some of your experiences, so we took to Twitter. Timbo says, ah, time for that weekly Sunday night panic attack. Jackie says, if it weren't for my crippling anxiety, I'd have more time to focus on my abysmal failures. Romeo has his way of dealing with it. He says, watching videos of sharks and whales swim really helps calm me when I can't stop crying or if I'm having a panic attack and I don't know why. Common band guys say, me, what could possibly be going wrong? Anxiety, glad you asked. And Princess says, anxiety is the most silent, painful experience. It makes no sense and you sit there alone and suffer for an unknown reason. Well, to give us a bit more of an understanding of what happens to us when we have anxiety and panic attacks is our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang. Welcome to the show, Audrey. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So obviously it's something that affects so many people, anxiety and panic attacks. What's the yeah. difference between the two? The biggest difference between anxiety and panic is that panic often doesn't have a trigger. Anxiety, it's usually something. It could be someone. It could be an event such as an exam or a competition or something like that. Mm. And it's also more low level. Panic, when it happens, it can come on just you don't even know it's going to happen and it just happens mm -hmm. and the intensity of the feelings when you're having a panic attack is so extreme mm -hmm. that it's it's incredibly frightening and the worst thing is because those symptoms are so scary there's a tightness in your chest you may feel very sick you might start sweating and um, the dsm-5 lists a whole host of symptoms and to be diagnosed with mm -hmm. panic you need to have four of those um but because they're so extreme that actually propagates it and makes it worse because you just feel it's not coming to an end and that's when you panic even more. So whilst anxiety can often almost be managed in the sense of when that event or that person or whatever it is you're feeling anxious about yeah. goes away, often so does the anxiety. Okay. With panic, you can't predict it quite as quite as well. But there must be something, because how can it just sort of come out of the blue like that and, and just attack? Them? Well, <laughs> Sometimes some people have panic attacks because of anxiety. They okay. may have it because of depression. They may have it mm. because of lots of PTSD, lots of different reasons. Um, I, I would personally see panic, panic attacks as almost a symptom, usually of okay. something yeah. else. Mm -hmm. um, but the worst thing is, of course, if, say, a constant state of anxiety has led to, because it might be anxiety over uh, claustrophobia or agoraphobia mm -hmm. or something like that which has led to a panic attack unfortunately that can then um, result in something like depression because of the behaviors that you may take okay. when you have that panic attack yeah. because the panic attack is so frightening it may even involve being physically sick mm -hmm. you get so scared of going out of the house so yeah, yeah. you start isolating yourself the minute you start isolating yourself then you don't get that stimulation from other people and that's one your first step into depression okay, yeah oh, so it's 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 a very difficult one um, there's things you can do mm -hmm. to deal with it and a lot of the things 
I would actually say you don't have to wait for a panic attack to strike before you start practicing them. Mm -hmm. Breathing is one of the biggest things because with panic, it's all about getting the focus back on the body again, be, being able to be in control again mm -hmm. and concentrating on your breathing, relaxing your muscles, sometimes even focusing on if you've got an analog clock where you've got the hand going along, yeah. you can, if you just focus on that, that can actually just bring you back to feeling calm again. And actually, if you have something like focusing on a clock, if you have something such as even counting backwards in twos, something else then you're not actually thinking about panicking okay. anymore so it's a distraction as well it's like a mindfulness thing then it way. is a little bit like a mind it's uh -huh. good to practice mindfulness or yoga or any of those sorts of breathing mm -hmm. um exercises just because if you already practiced in it it's a lot easier to do when when the time comes what can someone actually do to help like a fan, friend or family member would you say um, a couple of things. It can be a case of just getting that person to start focusing on the clock or focusing mm. on their breathing. Sometimes it may be about controlling your own emotions as well. A lot of the time, um, doctors will say parents who are very protective over their children because they have panic attacks or because they have epilepsy or they have some sort mm. of um, disorder that could turn up at any time, have a tendency to really overprotect their children and keep them okay. inside, not allow them to go out because you never know when you might have a panic attack. And that can actually sometimes be quite detrimental mm -hmm. to the child as well. So it's, it's almost about understanding it, teaching um, those techniques in order to be able to cope with it. So if you do feel, um, not so much, it's not a trigger, but if you do feel the sensation of it coming on, you can okay. start practicing the breathing, you can start practicing yeah. the focus mm -hmm. at once. That can be more beneficial than actually saying, well, don't go out at all. Which which, of course, as parents, when you when you care about your child and you don't want them to suffer without you, then yeah. you do want to protect them. The other thing is, and um, this is a client who suffers panic attacks. He said of his partner, his partner doesn't always know how to cope with them. Mm -hmm. But the one thing he's, he's got him to realize is that they will pass. Yeah. And that's one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. It's it, in the moment, it can be the most frightening thing, especially if you're watching someone and you you don't know what to do. And actually, if you don't know what to do, it sometimes is yeah. best not yeah. to mm -hmm. try and panic as well, because that it, it feeds. It's almost contagious and mm -hmm. high high levels of energy feed off each other. But if you know it's going to pass, then actually it's about saying, well, focus, think about your breathing and then yeah. go from there. Okay, brilliant. Audrey, thank you so much. Pleasure. We shall see you again next week. Thank, thank you. you. All right, guys, to get a bit more of an idea of what a panic attack can really feel like, here we have founder of Anxiety United, Billy Cross, explaining what he went through when he suffered a panic attack in a theater after watching his daughter perform. I had a major panic attack while I was sitting in the theater. And like, let me just briefly tell you what happened. So I was sitting, probably about halfway back from the front and there was nobody behind me it wasn't really busy in there there was a few parents up front but during the because you have to sit through like however many dancers there are in the category so I think there was probably about 15 and my daughter danced and that was lovely and I was ready for it and anticipating it and it filled me with pride but the like after my daughter had danced and I have to sit and watch the others dance that's when it's like you know that feeling that you get when you're just sitting and these were like old wooden school chairs and I'm sitting on there and I can feel myself probably I'm not swaying but I can feel just that feeling where it just feels like motion and then the breathing stuff and then you just start questioning how far away is the exit am I going to make it out of here without lying on the floor and everybody's going to look round and it's all going to be oh my god worst case scenario so I got up out of my chair midway through a performance and headed to the back and I was sitting with my son and I got to the doors of the theatre they were right at the back and they wouldn't open them because they won't let people in or out during performances which is fair enough because that's somebody's child up there that's put in their heart and soul into a performance like it's not fair to interrupt them by opening the doors and then crowds of people walking in so like the door was shut and I didn't make a scene. I just obviously, okay, no worries. Because that's the way that we do it, innit? If we're freaking out and we need to get out of somewhere quick, it's like we're always polite enough to just say, yep, yeah, no worries, I'll hold. Or excuse me if I need to walk past somebody. We're always polite. We're never like too freaked out to be able, like shoving and pushing people out of the way. Move! It never happens like that. We've, we're always of sane enough mind to like, Excuse me, please. Do you mind if I just step outside? Or I've just got a... My phone's ringing in my pocket. I've just got to nip out. 
we just got flat something, left it in the car. We all, we're always quick enough to think of excuses or whatever, because I don't know whether we're embarrassed or whatever. So I couldn't get out, to cut a long story short, and I just took myself over to the side, like I was in the corner of the theatre, right at the back. There was no seats there, it was just a standing bit, and I just sat on the floor. And like, probably nobody knew what was going on, it was just like, I'm just waiting here to get out once we're over. Like, I obviously didn't make a scene and I weren't flailing around, Way! because we don't do that, because we're too embarrassed. We're already embarrassed. And that's half of the reason that we're frigging freaking out trying to get out of there, because we're worried about what other people are going to think when we start gasping for air, but we're not. But that's just the psychological stuff, the escalation of the panic. After the break, Jasmine Weston will be telling me how she manages her anxiety and panic attacks and will be watching a video courtesy of the Mental Health Channel on how one man uses his creativity as a photographer to depict his experiences with social anxiety. But first, how many adults in Great Britain have experienced some form of neurotic health problem? Is it A, 1 in 6, B, 1 in 10 or C, 1 in 15? Have a little think and I'll tell you after the break. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone, your TV program for all things related to mental health, well-being, and success. Well, before the break, I asked you how many adults in Great Britain have experienced some form of neurotic health problem? Is it A, 1 in 6, B, 1 in 10, or C, 1 in 15? The answer is A, 1 in 6, which pretty much guarantees that somebody you work with will have suffered at some point in their life. We're here to share her experience with anxiety and panic attacks is Jasmine Weston. Hello Jasmine. Hi. Love to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. So this is the first time that you're talking about this on TV. Yeah. So thank you very much first of all for being brave to come and talk about this because it is something quite personal. Yeah. But you are willing to share your experiences to help our viewers of at course. home. Yeah. So tell us when did you have your first panic attack? Um, so my first panic attack occurred I think it was in my first year of university. Okay. Um, it was quite scary because I'd never felt those sensations before. Mm -hmm. And I'd always had anxiety, but I never actually had a panic attack itself until okay. I was much older. Okay. So what was it you actually <clears throat> went through? What happened? So I was driving oh. um, back from uni one night and suddenly I just felt like I started shaking. My heart was racing. I was sweating. Mm -hmm. Like my face went white. Apparently I looked like a ghost. Wow. Um, just the physical symptoms are basically like you're dying. I know that's quite exaggerated, but honestly, yeah. if someone knows what a panic attack feels like, they'll tell you. It feels like you're being, you're overcome by this like huge wave of just like death. Yeah. It's horrible. I know. I know exactly what you're saying because I used to have them myself really? for years and it's like, I just, the word I use to describe is terrifying. Yeah, exactly. Terror. Yeah, it's it so is really, it's, it's like not fear. fear. It's not fear. It's like fear is just too, <clears throat> It's too light. Like to a light word, isn't it? But yeah. it's, it's terrible. So how, how did that actually affect you? Actually, I wanted to ask you, first of all, had anything sort of led up to that? Had you been worried about anything or was it something that just came out of the blue? I think for me, my anxiety is quite generalised. Mm -hmm. it, it's not triggered by something specific, okay. which is almost even worse because you can't get to the root of that mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. So if you'd go and see someone and talk to them about, you know, why you're getting these anxious thoughts, mm -hmm. you can't go back to, to trace, it, to anything, to trace yeah. it and yeah. to see, okay, well, let's try and figure out why you're getting these panic attacks and where okay. it stemmed from. Okay. So. So after that first one that you had, how often did they start happening after that? All the time. I would wow. have them maybe two to three times a week. Um, and it got to the point where I couldn't be in a restaurant. I couldn't be in a nightclub because I was constantly looking for an escape route. I was constantly oh. looking for the exit. It wow. was almost like I needed to be in control of everything. That like, must have been quite difficult because some, some people will tend to have panic attacks maybe when they're at home by themselves, but this was yeah. actually you out, social Socially, occasions. 100%. Wow. And, you know, my ex, well, my ex boyfriend at the time, he had to deal with that as well. Yeah. So it can put a strain on your relationship and yeah. you feel like you have to rely on that one person. And What did um, he make of it when he saw you in that, in that state? Obviously, it's so hard for him because he's never experienced anxiety before. Mm. So, but he got used to the ways and 
how to deal with the phys like the physical symptoms and okay. we would have you know ways of sort of trying to calm me down and mm -hmm. he was that person and so is my dad so there's two people okay so that's how I can really relax and calm down what would you say the worst thing has been about these panic attacks and what has been what's been happening personally the worst thing is actually the symptoms the physical symptoms you get before the panic attack for me mm -hmm. is the worst because mm -hmm. these can last days hours and you don't feel well physically you feel unwell mm -hmm. and sometimes in what way, in it's, what way you, um, well? you just don't feel in control of your body like okay a lot of heart palpitations you don't feel right you feel a bit off mm -hmm. you know tunnel vision um blurred vision like it's it's quite it's very scary yes yeah it's very very physical that's the worst part for me not the actual panic attack itself because that lasts about i don't know 20 seconds max yeah. mm -hmm. for me anyway so that you can get over it's actually it's quite, it's a relief it. when you have the panic attack because the build-up mm -hmm. is so intense yeah. that you're like, okay, well, if something's going to happen, let Just it get happen on now. It. Just yeah. Get, yeah. It, get on with it. Okay. How, how has it actually affected your life to having these panic attacks? Um, it's debilitating. It really mm -hmm. is. Because any normal people, you know, before they go out, they don't think of, I'm constantly thinking of what if, what if something happens? Who do I call? Like, if my dad's not available, okay. I'm constantly thinking the worst, the worst mm. case scenarios. Even when I'm just going out to a friend's house, it's like, what could happen on the way? Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm constantly just on edge. Were you worried about coming to the studio today in case that would bring um, one on? I think I managed to keep myself quite calm today. Okay, that's good. Which was a good thing, yeah. but it's mostly sort of social situations like going okay. into shopping centers i mm. can't i find it really hard to be around a lot of people at the same time okay it's quite overpowering okay um small spaces lifts for example mm. um just things like that really scare me okay. so i'm working on it now interestingly your dad also has panic attacks yeah so did you actually grow up seeing that i didn't see it but I knew think that. it runs through through my dad, 100%. Okay. Because my dad has literally everything that I, I'm going through. Right. Okay. You know, I say to dad, I'm like, oh, dad, have you ever had this? You know, when you feel like your heart's yeah. fluttering, yeah. he's like, yes, doll, of course I have. Don't be silly, just ignore it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to my mum, she has no clue. clue. <laughs> She's like, oh, just get on with it, yeah. you know? It, it, it's just interesting that you're saying that, Jasmine, because for the viewers watching, and I know it's because you don't understand, but we can't, you know, people that are going through panic attacks, they can't just get over it. It's not something that you can sort of just kind of wish away or because who in their right mind would actually want to feel that way? So it's not because the person yeah. wants to feel that way that it's happening. It's, just, it's, something, <clears throat> it's something that's there that they can't get rid of until they get the right help and stuff like that. My boyfriend used to tell me, oh, you know, just be happy, get over it. And it's like, I used to get so angry because it's like, yeah. I don't actually want to feel this way. It's mm -hmm. just, it just comes. It's like all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and that heaviness used to come and yeah. that, you know, that anxiety. It was horrible. I know, I know what it feels like. So it's not something that people can just snap out of. They need, it's a condition and they need to get help with. So what did you actually do? Because now you're, you're quite good at actually managing yeah. your, your attacks now. So what, what have you learned to do? So there are loads of options for anyone out there that's suffering with anxiety. You know, mm. the NHS have great services, you know, you can go private, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. I um, started off, um, I spoke to someone, they were like, you know, take this, take two tablets a day, blah, blah, mm. but I didn't want to go down that route. Okay. I thought, you know, I want to try and do it for myself and mm. see if me, myself, with my willpower, I can okay. get through this and, mm -hmm. and try and figure it out. So that's what I did. I... Um, learn a lot of breathing exercises okay. you know I find that yoga really helps mm -hmm. if you have a good sleeping pattern before you go to bed you just really get into that relaxed mode so that you mm -hmm. wake up and you're content and you're not in that stress you know you've rushed to go to bed and um, you can also do CBT which is cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy which is a more technical way of um, 
getting to the root of mm. your anxiety. But it's the breathing that really that really yeah. actually helps you. So, so now, would you say that you actually manage to stop the panic attack from coming, or, or you sort of feel it from before and then you apply these techniques and then it stops it, or do you still sometimes experience well, it? Now, when I know that I'm going to have a panic attack, I, I use my techniques of breathing because I think it resets your body. Okay. I think that's so important because once you start getting anxious, once you start panicking, you stop breathing. Mm -hmm. You forget how to breathe. And it's so important yeah. to actually reset your body, reset your mind. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a bit cliche. It's like, oh, just take a few deep breaths, but it really does work. Yeah. You'd be surprised. It really does make a difference. Okay. So that's what I do at the moment. And I talk to myself. I think self-reassurance mm -hmm. is really important as well. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Jasmine, thank you so much for coming on to share your experience. I'm sure that's helped our viewers. Thank you thank for having you. me. Brilliant. All right, guys, so don't go away because now we actually have a video courtesy of the Mental Health Channel. It took me a number of years to be able to make work about the anxiety. So showing the images at first did make me nervous because I wasn't sure how people were gonna react and what conclusions they were gonna draw about me based on those photographs. I think growing up, and especially as I moved into high school, I think I started to, to withdraw. What I thought was just being shy sort of became more than that. As I started college, you know, I would miss a class and then, um, you know, feel like I couldn't go to the next class and then it would sort of build on itself. My phone would ring and I just couldn't physically get myself to pick up the phone and answer. There was a sense of embarrassment to admit to people that I wasn't able to fix this by myself. It caused me to withdraw more. You know, I felt trapped in a lot of ways. Ten years ago, I went to a mall. I remember there were so many different sounds, like different conversations. I was self-conscious to the point where I thought there's no way that people wouldn't be making a judgment about everything I was doing. As the anxiety was building, it felt very physical. It felt very visceral. I felt very flushed and hot. My hands were trembling. And then, you know, I, I ran. I ran away from it. The lowest point for me was when I ran into a professor of a class that I hadn't been to in several months. And he asked if I was OK and told me he had been trying to get in touch with me. I think I may have like actually sat on the ground crying and of course like it was in the middle of this public space. I think it was the first time that I sort of admitted to myself that I didn't have control over what was happening. I didn't have control over the anxiety. I met with a psychiatrist and was diagnosed with social anxiety disorder. After the diagnosis, I started medicine and meeting with a therapist. You know, we started doing cognitive behavioral therapy to help me get a, a better grasp on what I was experiencing and how to sort of process those experiences. Within a couple of weeks, I, I started to feel more in control. But it took about seven years, I think, after my diagnosis to get to the point where I felt comfortable making images about it. Before I shoot each image, I usually make a sketch of what um, I want the final photograph to be. The image I'm working on now is a house plant with the leaves wrapped in hair curlers. The series is titled It's Hardly Noticeable. The character in my series is, I think, is trying to navigate living with this anxiety without revealing that that's what he's doing. The goal with each of the images is to take this abstract idea of anxiety and turn it into something that can be photographed installation images show the world of this character. This image comments on the very often thin line between comfort and fear. The still lives are representations of mindsets or beliefs. The glass is full, but the leaks sort of imply that it's, it's really a temporary fullness. 
The self-portraits act as a way to explore to what degree these are images of a character and to what degree these are images of myself. So in this image, the character is confined by this chalk outline on the sidewalk. There's not anything literally keeping him trapped, but he is still physically unable to move from it. The image I'm working on now is about an attempt to imbue control onto something that is fighting that. For a while, I was worried that making images about the anxiety would cause me to re-experience the anxiety. You know, and in reality, it's it sort of had the opposite effect. They've been a way of indulging that anxiety and still staying productive. The work has been featured by the Huffington Post and NPR and Wired Magazine, and, and I've really been honored by the response. The anxiety is something that, you know, it's been a number of years since it was at its worst. You know, it is something that, that still comes up. It's something I think about. I think that's always going to be there. But, you know, these busy places, I am okay. I don't really get anxious about it. Part of it is just sort of recognizing that it's there and making sure that it doesn't reach the point that it did before. In the fall, I'm starting a visiting professorship where I'm teaching photography and new media. Being a professor is sort of the epitome of what I was scared of happening before. Room full of people watching me and listening to everything I say and, and watching everything I do. It is strange, but I love it. Hello? I'm really lucky that I have such a supportive and loving and encouraging family. <laughs> Opening up about it with my family and, and my friends, it forced me to summon up courage to be open about something that I had really been making an effort to hide. 15 million American adults are struggling with social anxiety. I think the most important thing is to remember that they're not alone in that struggle. They're not alone in experiencing those things. Well, after the break, nutritionist Lily Suter will be telling me about the many ways in which nutrition can affect anxiety and panic attacks. Hi, I'm Chrissy B, and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel, Sky203. Visit ChrissyBShow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone, your TV program for all things related to mental health and well-being. So now I'm delighted to introduce our lovely nutritionist, Lily Suter, to the program. Hello, Lily. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> so you're going to be telling us a bit about um, anxiety and panic attacks and what we can actually eat to help prevent those kind of things. And also you're going to be making something very yes. shortly. But first of all, can you tell us, is there a link between what we eat and the way that we feel regarding anxiety? So um, when it comes to nutrition and anxiety, there are certain foods that may exasperate symptoms or sort of certain dietary factors. Mm -hmm. And then there are also some foods which can actually be very calming to the body. Yeah. Um, I think a main area which we need to look at is caffeine. So caffeine okay. is a stimulant mm -hmm. and anxiety is actually a stressor on the body. It puts us, our bodies into sort of a fight or fight mode and it produces the stress hormone cortisol. Mm -hmm. And caffeine can actually do exactly the same thing. Thing. It's an acute stressor okay. on the body. Um, it stimulates adrenaline, which stimulates the release of the stress hormone cortisol. So you sort of got a double whammy there, which is not so great. Yeah. So different people can tolerate caffeine to a different extent. Different people have different thresholds of how much mm -hmm. they can have. And some people can have a lot of caffeine and feel fine, whereas others start feeling jittery and it can just exasperate anxiety. So I guess just cutting back on the caffeine, if you do suffer from anxiety or panic attacks, it's never gonna help just yeah. like piling yeah. up on the caffeine. So mm -hmm. there's so many calming herbal teas out there. So chamomile tea, there's a lot of research around chamomile tea and its calming effects. Mm -hmm. 
Lavender is very, very calming as well. Um, lemon balm, lemon balm is sort of a, a, a member of the mint family. And again, there's a lot of research around anxiety and, and lemon balm tea. Um, and I think like with anxiety, people do struggle with sleep. It's just a massive factor which can be linked to anxiety. Mm -hmm. And valerian root is sort of the herb of choice when it comes to sleep disorders and, yeah. and anxiety. And it can be very, very calming. So a cup of valerian root tea an hour before bed can be perfect to help sort of just calm you and, and help induce sleep. The one thing I would say with that is if you're going to have any herbal teas is always just go to your doctor first, check yeah. that your medication doesn't interact with those herbs. So especially okay. for say valerian root, it can interact with certain medications. So yeah. just double checking that, that before you do embark on herbal teas. So okay. yeah, herbal teas are great. <laughs> just, just, you know, just something else. Have you ever seen cats react around valerian root tea? So no, I haven't. Funny, it's so funny. Both Gosh. of my cats, yeah, they go crazy. Oh really? I that's so they, interesting. Yeah, is, yeah. Try it if you can. Yeah, yeah cats just will do. Wave a, a valerian root tea yeah, and see how they react. So, so interesting. <laughs> so you're going to be making something for us as well. I will do. Yeah, and um, I was going to talk actually about omega three fats. Okay, yes, I've got yeah. some sardines here as well, yeah. which are so so rich in these healthy omega three fats. And when uh -huh. it comes to anxiety, there is a link. And there was a study done uh, with medical students where they had supplements of omega three fats, mm -hmm. and their anxiety symptoms reduced by twenty percent. Uh, saying that that was one study, but I mm -hmm. think the link is just purely because our brain is basically made up of these healthy omega-3 fats. About 60% of the brain is fat, basically. So yeah. there is a strong link um, there. And I guess like with the other components of the salad, we've got spinach here, yes. um, which is very, very rich in magnesium. So anything which mm -hmm. is sort of dark green leafy veg, spinach, kale, rocket, You've got Thanks. magnesium in okay. it, which is a very, very calming mineral and can help to alleviate anxiety and also mm -hmm. can help with sleep as well. Okay, so quite a, an interesting combination there, but let's yeah. see how it all works together. So you've got a bit of salt uh, and sweet flavors combined, yes. a little bit of healthy fats as well. So first thing is obviously the magnesium rich spinach leaves. So it's a very, very simple salad to make. Um, Just take that one out. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, what we do is we just top it with a little bit of mango. Um, Doesn't that look lovely already, just that green and yellow? Yeah, so lots of antioxidants there, just purely because of all the rich yeah. colours that, mm -hmm. that you have. So, and then um, what I like to do is add a little bit of avocado. Mm. So these are full of healthy fats and what they're going to do is they help to balance blood sugar, which again is really important for anxiety, yeah. as soon as our blood sugar levels crash, mm -hmm. it can induce anxiety basically, or irritability or touchiness. So yeah. um, you just slice the avocado and you can place on the plate however you like. Two of my favorite ingredients, so the avocado and the mango. Yeah, exactly. Love them. Yeah. And there we go. So you have your avocado on the plate. And then a really important component of the salad is the sardines. So these are yes. really, really rich in mm -hmm. omega-3 fats. Um, the smaller the fish, almost, and when it comes to oily fish, almost it's the healthier, okay. be purely because it has less mercury in it. Oh, so okay. small oily fish are really healthy and not enough people eat sardines because they're sort of not as common as say sort of salmon. So I actually forget to eat sardines. Yeah. I, I eat salmon and things like that, but I forget to sort of just keep a couple of tins in the Yeah, exactly. The and they're, they're just something which can be really easy and they taste really great to add in salads, but they're just not something that people always necessarily think of. So. Um, and you've got sort of the salt and sweet flavours together, which can yeah. taste really great. Um, this will also add a protein element and protein can help to balance blood sugar. Okay. And then lastly, we squeeze some lime juice on. That looks so yummy. And yeah. healthy, look at that. Yeah, very healthy. Brilliant. And then, yeah, and, and that's voila. your salad. Lunch is served, or dinner, or whatever yeah. you want to have it, even breakfast. Just summery <laughs> salad, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Lily, we've got also a few questions from yes. our viewers for you today. Uh, this person is asking, what are good foods <clears throat> to eat whilst intermittently fasting? 
Okay, so I think it's important to think about what actually intermittent fasting is because a lot of mm. people don't really know and it's basically an umbrella term for diets which do cycles of periods with fasting and then mm. periods without fasting. And there are several out there. And a, a good example of a very popular diet which uses intermittent fasting is the 5-2 diet. Mm -hmm. And this is basically where you have two days a week where you could be eating something like 500 calories for each day. And then the rest of the week you eat your calorie consumption as per normal, as per okay. usual. Yeah. Um, the, the issue with that is I, you know, some clients I see, they will do the 500 calorie day and they, you know, whacking in all these unhealthy foods oh. um, and they're foods which aren't nourishing to the body and they're not filling either. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily going to be healthy and you will feel you will struggle with this intermittent fast and you'll be very hungry if you're filling up on, you know, nutrient poor foods, which are very mm -hmm. high in sugar. So starting your day with sort of, I don't know, white toast with jam and then moving on to a very low calorie energy bar, which is full mm -hmm. of sugar. Sugar, sugar will not f fill you. Um, so rather than solely focusing on the calories that you're having, it's good to think about the nutrition content okay. of the food. Yeah. Make sure you're getting a protein element on your plate. Protein will basically fill you. It suppresses appetite. Mm -hmm. If you can get a healthy fat element as well, which again could come from, say, avocado, yeah. Yeah. great. And I think, say you are doing a 500 calorie day, whacking in tons of vegetable, lots of fiber into your diet mm. as much as possible. So filling at least two thirds of your plate with lots of low starch vegetables, which are very low in calories, mm -hmm. but are very, very filling and they're very nourishing at the same okay. time. Okay. So yeah. brilliant. Okay, got time for another one. Um, I'm 21 and I suffer with quite serious heartburn. What can I do to reduce the symptoms? It's quite young okay. to have. Yeah, heartburn. so they're, they're quite common uh, triggers which are well known um, and it doesn't mean that she has to completely uh, remove all of these triggers it's just something to be mm -hmm. mindful of uh, very large meals can trigger heartburn just too much pressure within the stomach can sort of mm -hmm. induce acid reflux and then okay. heartburn can be sort of a, a symptom of that spicy foods can trigger it as mm -hmm. well for some people um, alcohol Caffeine. I've spoken to a lot of people who um, find citrus fruits. It's very interesting. Can trigger oh. heartburn. So okay. sort of even limes, um, lemons, grapefruit, uh, oranges. All these sort of citrus fruits may mm. trigger heartburn. High fat meals. Very very sort of fatty meals for some people can trigger heartburn. And okay. it's a case we don't always know what's going to trigger, and it can be different for each person. But those are probably the most common triggers, and it's okay. just something to have in the back of your mind. So. Okay. Brilliant, thanks for that. And one more. Um, I have recently been diagnosed with diabetes. What is best for me to eat? This person's asking. So the key with that is just balancing blood sugar. And I know I talk a lot about blood sugar, but it's just so, so, so vital. Yeah. So with each meal, there needs to be a protein element. Protein will literally slow the rate at which sugar from a carbohydrate or from a sugar source like a fruit mm -hmm. enters the bloodstream. So it will slow the rate that any sugar enters the bloodstream. So it's a very key component. Okay. So will fat. So whether it's healthy fats coming from seeds or nuts mm -hmm. or oils or avocado, and so will fiber. So you find mm -hmm. fiber in things like vegetables, in fruit, and also in whole grains. So fiber, fat, protein is key at each meal and snack. There is one element which um, sometimes when I speak to people with diabetes, they, they, there's a little confusion around it and they reducing sugar within their diet in the sense of cakes, biscuits, sweets, soft yeah. drinks, and they're getting rid of those, but they're actually replacing those sugars with tons of fruit and, and yeah, dried yeah, fruit. Yeah. And I think some people think that, you know, they're doing really well in that sense because they are cutting out the refined sugars mm -hmm. from their diet. But we've still got to remember if you're starting your day with, you know, two bananas in your smoothie or a yeah, very, yeah. you know, f fruit rich smoothie, it will still spike oh. your blood sugar. So it's being mindful of the amount or the types of fruit you're having. And just mm -hmm. as a little fact, Berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries tend to have the lowest uh, sugar content out of all the oh, fruits. Okay. So oh, um, it's just something to be mindful of. Brilliant. Lily, yeah. thank you so no much. No problem at and all. We'll see you again very soon. Great. In the see you soon. Brilliant. Okay, don't go away because after the break, I'll be hearing from Mark Abrahams of our Good Cause of the Week Recycle Your Cycle. And I'll be telling you two things you can do to reduce stress and stop anxiety. But first, what is the most common age group of those struggling with anxiety or depression? Is it A, 26 to 30, B, 32 to 36, or C, 50 to 54? Do you know the answer? Find out after the break.
Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone. Now, before the break, I asked you what the most common age group of those struggling with anxiety or depression is. Is it A, 26 to 30, B, 32 to 36, or C, 50 to 54? The answer is C, 50 to 54, according to the Office for National Statistics, who also say there is a higher proportion of women than men suffering from the condition. Well, now it's time to move on to our good cause of the week, which, as you know, is our way of celebrating all the wonderful charities, organizations and individuals that are doing amazing things for others' mental health and well-being. And if you know of anyone who would like to be featured on the show, then do contact us on info at chrissybshow.tv. Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Abrahams, founder of Recycle Your Cycle. Hello, oh, Mark. Mark. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the show. It's lovely to have you here. So tell us, what is uh, Recycle Your Cycle? It kind of says it in the thing, but how, <laughs> how does it all work and how did it all come Okay, let about? me explain. So Recycle Your Cycle has been running for around two years. Mm -hmm. um, it all happened by chance. I actually had a friend of mine introduce me to a local prison. He was doing some work in the local prison, and he came to me and said, Mark, they're looking at setting up other workshops and expanding the workshops they've got. Okay. Maybe Maybe you should come in with me and see if you've got any ideas. I said, well, I know nothing about the prison service. I work in IT, yeah. but I'm happy to go along and, and have a chat with them. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest with you, I think it was more of a ruse just to actually go inside a prison and just see what it's like, because I'd never had that experience okay. before. So I went in, and I was shown around various workshops, but the one that really impressed me was the bicycle shop, because of the enthusiasm mm -hmm. from the instructor running it, mm -hmm. but also seeing the prisoners and the satisfaction they were getting out, and the enthusiasm and the passion they had around the bicycles. Mm -hmm. They kind of felt, this is interesting. So the instructor came up to me and said, look, we're only small, but I want to expand it. We don't get enough bicycles in to keep them busy all the time. Plus, I would like to get some more prisoners involved. Um, can you help us? Mm -hmm. I said, look, I know nothing about bicycles. I can't even ride a bicycle, but leave <laughs> it with me. <laughs> I can't ride a bicycle. Okay. Um, but That's leave it with me. Um, yeah. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. So we went out, we scraped around through eBay and Gumtree and picked up about 30, 40 old bicycles. Mm -hmm. took them into the prison and they did the most fantastic job refurbishing these bicycles. Oh. They came out great. Yeah. They thought, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's talk to a couple of charity shops and see if yeah. they may be interested in selling them. Okay. So the ch charities tried it and they loved it. And they loved it for two reasons. One is because it differentiated them from other charities. Yeah. If you think how many charity shops are selling bicycles. That's true. And the second thing is there's good profit margin yeah. in it as well for them. So they were raising good money for their particular cause. Wow. So we kind of said, I think we've got something of interest here. Two years down the road now, we now work with seven prisons around the country. We refurbish in excess of 300 bikes per month. So that's wow, keeping yeah. over 100 prisoners working and employed. Um, we get donations now coming in from various places, which is universities, police. Mm -hmm. um, we've just done a big promotion with Evan Cycles. They've been great to us. They've given us over 1,500 bikes in the last two months wow. for their trading. Mm -hmm. So now we have a supply of bicycles coming in. We have the workshops. And we work with over 25 charities around the country that take the bicycles and sell them That's for their amazing. particular cause. So from humble beginnings, yeah. it's now up and running. In addition to that, we've now started a new workshop as well, mm -hmm. um, refurbishing vacuum cleaners. Oh, okay. So we're now Another expert one. on Dyson's and Henry vacuum cleaners. Okay. <laughs> um, we are currently, we have about 200 in stock at the moment. And mm -hmm. again, they'll be going out to the charity shops as well to enable them to yeah. raise additional funds for their money. So Such I'm a sitting here. Such Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So my wife's sitting there over there thinking, he owns 200 Dyson's. It's a shame you can't find ours at home really. But <laughs> I'll have to deal with that later. When are you going to learn to ride a bike? I know. I have tried. I think we should film this. Do I you? think we should you film would. you You're trying. Going to I, I could manage to get, I think, from where you are to the camera, and that's about it, without falling flat on my face. That's a bizarre thing. I sit there and say to people, I currently have about 2,000 bicycles in stock yeah, that I own, such... but I can't ride one of them. So here's that's your pretty this. challenge for you. <laughs> so you can send us film some... me. Yeah, film film me. me. Thank you. Thank now, you. Now, Mark, I mean, it's, it's brilliant what you've achieved. Now, are you still working in IT, or are you doing this now full-time? No, no, I, I still work imagine. in IT. How I do still you cope with job. It's, it's interesting. It's very, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of time management. But yeah. um, I'm kind of become very passionate about this. I mean, it's a social yeah. enterprise. So yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to make a living out of it. Yeah. So I have to do something else as well. Uh -huh. But uh, just seeing the satisfaction coming from both the prisoners and also from the charities yeah. is what's driving us forward. You know, what I've explained to you, considering we started this two years ago with no plan, yeah. you know, two years down the road, we've now got a plan. Yeah. And the plan is we've now on phase one, 
-hmm. Phase two is to say, actually, we now want to develop some workshops outside of prison because what I want to do is help ex-offenders, yeah, yeah. but also people with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So people who would benefit from that kind of vocational, practical yeah, kind yeah, of work. Um, there's a charity that we're starting with called Jamie, based in North London. Mm -hmm. They're a mental health charity. So we're hoping in the next couple of months to get a workshop up and running with them. And we're Brilliant. looking for others around the country. And then phase three is to actually- He's got plans, he has plans. Yeah, it's great. And then phase three is to actually create employment. Okay. So what I'd love to have is mobile bike mechanics and vacuum repair people. You know, take a van, fit it out as a workshop wow. and have people going around fixing. So you've taken somebody mm -hmm. through that cycle of having to be looked after yeah, yeah. to actually becoming self sufficient so that's the plan we're not there yet we've still got a way that to go absolutely amazing. But at least we've got some direction tell, tell us a bit more about the impact that it is having on prisoners what have, have you had some feedback and what, what they've been saying about all, doing all of this all very positive what yeah. one is they enjoy doing it in the prison you know it's something that is productive you know they feel one they're giving something back to society yeah because they know that the bikes are going to charity but mm -hmm. from their perspective they feel fulfilled because they, they can see something they've achieved. Yeah. You know, you've taken an old broken bicycle, they fixed it, it's now ready to go out the door. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because they start to get particular areas they want to specialise in, they, they want to focus on. So for example, we can turn up with a van load of bikes and as they're coming off, different people will grab different bikes. <laughs> so you're like, one guy only wants to work on vintage bikes. Okay. That's all I do, I do yeah, vintage bikes. Yeah. He'll do the vintage bikes. Somebody else does children's bikes, somebody else does yeah. the racers. And some of them become bike snobs as well. So they turn around and say, <laughs> Mark, there's nothing on there, you know. And so it's actually yeah. very interesting just to see the job satisfaction that they're getting out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, that this is why we kind of want to do it and, and kind of just yeah. grow it and, and open more prison workshops as well. And you can see how excited you are about it as well, how passionate you <laughs> Thank are. You. It does, Thank you know, you. when you're doing something like this to help others, it really does also help your own well-being, does. doesn't it? It does, it but you know, there's, you know, there's a lovely example just recently is um, I was at one of the workshops and there was um, one of the guys clearly, you know, unfortunately had learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, went into prison, wanted to get into the bike shop. And the bike shop turned around and said, you can't until you've got level one maths and English. So he went away, took him, you know, several months to get level, level one maths and English, mm, but he was determined because yeah. he wanted to get in the bike shop. He got it, he's in the bike shop. He's the most fantastic bike really? mechanic. Oh, well, I go in go. there and say, Mark, Mark, come over here, come over here, Mark, Mark, Mark look, look, look what I've done, look what I've just finished. Okay, look what I'm about to work yeah. on. And he's just surrounded with parts, you know, there's cogs and there's nuts and there's <laughs> bolts and there's just stuff around him. And he's just happy oh, as Larry, so but he's nice. doing, yeah. you know, in all seriousness though, he's doing a fantastic job. You know, he's a very, very good bike mechanic. He will put that yeah. bike back together and it will be as good as new when he's finished. Wonderful. And so hopefully that'll help with employment prospects okay. when they come to leave. Mark, can the public get involved in any, any way with this? Well, uh, what? I suppose one key area is go to the hospice shops and buy my bikes and vacuum cleaners. <laughs> buy the bikes. <laughs> yeah. Buy the bikes and vacuum cleaners. And probably all the other stuff that they're going to start refurbishing soon, I'm sure. Recycling. Well, uh, yeah. Well, look, our aim. Um, so that's really where the general public can get yeah. involved. You know, yeah. going out, you know, televising this is to say, you know, our next step is we want to do workshops on the outside working mm -hmm. with, I said, people with mental health issues. So is there anybody out there who runs a charity or okay. an, an enterprise that would love to work? Brilliant. with them on doing that. Um, but what we're also looking for is just other, what we want to do is find products mm -hmm. that the prisoners can get a skill that will help their employment product uh, prospects. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if you can refurbish a bicycle, you've got that skill set, or a vacuum cleaner, when you leave, there's an opportunity to find employment. Yeah, definitely. Um, whether it's working for somebody or even go self-employed. You know, there's enough yeah. self-employed bike mechanics and vacuum clean people out there. Those opportunities come okay. along. You know, okay. what's one of the key reasons for reoffending? You know, no job, no money. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? You fall back into your old ways. You can actually come out and actually have that opportunity. Yeah, Hopefully, yeah. we can reduce reoffending. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, Mark. Thank you so Thank you. much, and all the best for the future. Thank you very and much. We're waiting for that video from you. <laughs> On a bicycle. Hold into this. All right, guys. So don't go away because we've got more for you just after this. Hey guys, so I've got a couple of minutes left to talk about anxiety and panic attacks and how to actually deal with these things. So the first one 
is to remember that it will pass. So we all go through stressful periods. It could be things maybe piling up at home, maybe your child not being very well, or extra work that's come up on top of the things that you already have to do. But it's really important to put things into perspective and realize that it's not going to last forever. It will pass. And if you panic about it, you won't actually get things done at home. You'll be of little or no use to your poorly child and the extra work you have won't actually get done. And the second point is, to learn to calm yourself down. So when we feel a bit anxious about something, you know, the body does actually react as we heard today. So your breathing will quicken, adrenaline is released, and this is your body actually doing, going into survival mode, known as, as we heard earlier, fight or flight. So it's actually designed that way to help us escape a real life threatening situation. So if that's what's happening, you need to somehow tell your body that you're not actually in any danger. So try sort of telling yourself, you know, everything's gonna be fine, you're going to sort this out, don't worry and then find something that you know will help you to, re to relax so we heard from our real life story I guess she actually uh, uses breathing techniques other people can maybe go for a nice walk put them put their attention on something else there are different ways to cope but sometimes it's just that thought of thinking oh my god this is just going to last forever and actually it's not going to last forever you will get go through certain phases in your life when things are more stressful and things are are difficult but the trick is to actually um, deal with that as best you can and remember you will pass through that as well well, everyone, we have reached the end of today's program. But if you have an experience that you would like to share with us, maybe you have a comment about today's program or any of, of our episodes, please do get in touch with us. You can email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page of The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to know more about me and how I overcame panic attacks and anxiety, among other mental health issues, you can visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye for now.